Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Rob Rennie. I'm a member of the Brooklyn's Talks team, one of Steve Clark's lieutenants. Very warm welcome you to tonight. This is a sellout, 250 people again. Fantastic turnout. Great for the museum as well. Tonight, we've got something rather special on. We've got an accomplished author who's written some very interesting books on aviation. He is a photojournalist and writes regularly in the aeroplane. Many of you must read this. And uh, very informed gentleman all round. It's my great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce Dennis Calvert. Right, thank you. Firstly, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's good to see such a huge turnout. Um, it's partly the subject. I, I'm still amazed that there's so much interest in an aeroplane that made its last flight, not its first flight, its last flight, 50 years, 55 years ago this year. So tonight, I'll try and tell the story of TSR2. Um, I've got about an hour and 15. It's an emotive story. It's one around which many myths have grown up over the years. It's also one with close, very close connections with Weybridge, which I guess is why I'm here tonight. Consensus opinion is that the program's cancellation in 1965 marked the start of a rundown in Britain's aircraft industry from which it never really recovered. Certainly, and perhaps inevitably, because of the program's cost, TSR2 had its friends and its enemies in equal numbers. It soon became a political aeroplane, even if its origins were in a straightforward operational requirement. That operational requirement was issued in 1957, GOR 339, General Operational Requirement 339, a ministry requirement and, and wish list for a new aeroplane. This is XR 222 at, uh, at the War Museum at Duxford, one of two surviving airframes. The RAF's stated need was to replace the Canberra in 1957. In fact, the Canberra had only entered frontline service some six years earlier, and it also had an ex excellent export record, including licensed production in the States. Nobody at that time suggested that the Canberra might have another 50 years service ahead of it. In fact, it was only finally retired in 2006. If they had suggested it, they'd surely have been patted on the head and told to go and lie in a darkened room until the fever passed. At the time, Britain's finances were in a dreadful state. The Cold War showed no, no sign of thawing, and the British Empire was in decline. As former colonies achieved their independence, the RAF's need for permanent, reliable military bases in the Middle and Far East only increased, as did the need for an aircraft with a good range of action, hence GOR 339. This is the Canberra T4, the aeroplane that pretty much every Canberra crew started their uh, careers flying. Virtually every British company, aircraft company, submitted its own design to GOR 339. The requirements specified by the Ministry were, to say the very least, ambitious. The aircraft had to be capable of operation from a runway of 3,000 feet, to have a radius of action of 1,000 nautical miles, with the final 200 miles to and from the target at low level and, to quote the requirement, at not less than Mark 0.95. A supersonic dash capability at low level was deemed desirable, and weapons release was to be either by loft from low level labs or from medium level, all very demanding. The Blackburn NA39, which became the Buccaneer, already existed and was moving towards frontline service. But even in its developed Buccaneer two star variant, it failed to meet the requirement of the RAF in many respects. The most serious one was it was decidedly subsonic. But perhaps worse than that, it was a Royal Navy aircraft, and inter-service rivalries once more came to the fore. De Havilland's proposal, and this is a typical proposal to 339, envisaged a two-seat aeroplane, mid-winged, with two potted engines, and an internal bomb base sized to accommodate a single nuclear weapon. 
With a maximum overload weight of 60,000 pound, it was capable of Mark II at altitude, but fell short on the required range. But I think what is significant is the aeroplane was relatively small. De Havilland recognised that the RAS procurement budget was limited and that for any given sum, more aircraft could be put into service and thus give greater operational flexibility. Encouraged to think out of the box, even if that phrase didn't really come to fore that early, um, some designs that were proposed for 339 adopted a truly radical approach to meeting the requirement. This is the P17A, P17D proposal put forward by English Electric and Short. It had the strike aircraft, English Electric's P17A, which looks passably like TSR2 in its final form, being taken aloft on a vertical launch platform, that's Short's P17D, powered by, wait for it, 56 Rolls-Royce RB108 engines. <laughs> This would certainly have met the short field requirement, <laughs> which, was requ which was referred to at times as Mark II from a cabbage patch, but one wonders as to its practicality and service. Politics enter the story here, perhaps inevitably. The government of the day wanted to use GOR 339 to bring about the rationalisation of Britain's aircraft manufacturing companies with the aim of creating two large groups. The two most promising designs to 339 were deemed to be English Electric's P17A and Vickers Type 571. And the contract was awarded to those two companies on the condition of their merging into a larger group. The decision was announced on the 1st of Jan 59 by the Ministry of Supply that the development of the aircraft would be, wait for it, undertaken jointly by Vickers Armstrong's and English Electric the main contract being paced with Vickers Armstrongs for the work to be shared between the two companies on a 50-50 basis. Also that a project team drawn from both companies would be established at Vickers Works at Weybridge. The aircraft would be designated TSR2 for tactical strike and reconnaissance and not everybody agrees on this and Mark II. This is relevant, trust me. People sometimes ask, what was TSR1? <laughs> the best I can offer is that Fairies in 1934 produced a design for a torpedo spotter reconnaissance aircraft for the Royal Navy as TSR1. A developed variant with longer fuselage was the TSR2, which achieved frame in World War II as the swordfish. Anyway, that was an aside. Returning to the TSR2 in question, the desired, that's desired by the government, industry integration was announced early in 1960. English Electric, Vickers Armstrongs and Bristol, and later Hunting, were joined to form the British Aircraft Corporation, BAC. So it was effectively BAC that formed later in 1960 that took on the TSR2 contract. Although never announced as such, an earlier agreement made by the government ensured that the engine for TSR2 would be supplied by Bristol Siddeley engines. This was to reward the company's recent integration, Bristol Aero engines and Armstrong Siddeley motors, as Bristol Siddeley engines, and to balance their workload against that of rivals, Rolls-Royce. A bit of local interest. In 1959, the Viscount airliner was still coming off the Vickers production lines and the Vanguard was entering flight test. The VC-10 programme was well underway with the first flight programmed for a couple of years away. Studies continued on a short-haul jet, which would eventually crystallise as the 111, which would go on to have a sales success second only to that of the Viscount. On the other hand, Vickers' only recent military programmes had been the Valiant V-bomber, and the Scimitar shipborne fighter, the latter built at Supermarines South Marston factory. The Weybridge factory was not short of work, although neither Vanguard nor VC-10 would see anything like the sales success of the Viscount. This is an early shot of an early one, of a 111 British United in a Weybridge hangar with TSR2 assembly underway at the other end. English Electric had factories at Accrington, Preston and Salmsbury, up north. 
and a well-developed flight test facility at Wharton. Wharton Airfield was well-placed with access to a supersonic corridor down the Irish Sea and to low-level routes over the Lake District. Both of these would be of great benefit when TSR2 got into its flight test program. It also had unrivaled, or at least unrivaled for a British manufacturer, experience of supersonic military aeroplanes, having developed the Mark II Lightning. Nevertheless, the decision was taken to site the final assembly line for the TSR-2 at Weybridge, even if it was unlikely to be possible to fly the aircraft from that location's rather short runway. As an aside, to fly VC-10 airliners the short hop out of Weybridge to nearby Wisley, an extra few hundred feet of concrete was added to the runway. That said, what worked for VC-10 was deemed unacceptable for TSR-2. This decision was one of several that would adversely and severely affect TSR2's program. Despite the bullet point on this slide, the design adopted for the BAC TSR2 as built was much more than a simple fusion of Vickers Type 571 and English Electric's P17A. It incorporated some features of each design and some from elsewhere and the aircraft started a seemingly inexorable growth in capability, weight, complexity, and, of course, cost. GOR339, which had been issued in four drafts, was replaced in May 1959 by the more specific GOR343. The 1957, that's just an example, but the 1957 English Electric P17A envisaged a 70,000-pound aircraft capable of Mark 1.8. TSR-2 ended up as a 110,000-pound aircraft capable of Mark 2.25. Vickers took on board the ever-increasing demands, yet still advised the Air Ministry that these would clearly increase costs and lengthen timescales. The project creep, I can only call it that, continued. Like Topsy, TSR-2 just grew. The revised GOR343 was yet more demanding. <laughs> Still the most critical part was the short field requirement. This demanded a takeoff run of no more than 3,000 foot for the full 1,000 nautical mile radius sortie, and less than 3,000 foot for dispersed operation. The landing roll was required to be 1,800 feet, sorry, yes, 1,800 18, feet on a wet surface with a 35 knot crosswind. This was difficult, if not impossible, to achieve on an aircraft as large as TSR-2. The project creep, unfortunately, continued. This is a BAC advertisement in Flight Magazine's issue of the 7th of February 1963. Under the headline, TSR-2 Under Construction, the text ran, now on the production line, TSR-2 is being built into an advanced requirement which will result in the delivery to the Royal Air Force of the world's most flexible tactical strike reconnaissance weapons system. If it all worked as advertised, BAC would have an extremely advanced aeroplane on its hands. A few details of TSR-2. The undercarriage required was a massive affair. Two main gear bogies with twin wheels and large tyres to meet the grass field part of the requirement. Exactly how the undercarriage would retract became a major point of discussion within the design team during the early months of the project. The eventual decision, said to be the result of the insistence of Sir George Edwards, Executive Director of BAC, was that it would, should retract forwards. This would allow gravity and airflow to assist with its lowering in the emergency case. The nose gear was a more traditional twin wheel leg, which retracted rearwards. The decision that a developed Bristol Siddeley Olympus turbojet would be, adapted as, would be adopted as TSR2's power plant was announced in January 1959. The original Olympus was already in RAF service, four of them powering the Vulcan V bomber. But these were 100 series engines giving between 11 and 13,000 pound thrust. The Olympus for TSR2, designated 22R, the R for reheat, which is how the Brits referred to afterburning in those days, and was to be the first afterburning version of the Olympus. The 22R would also be Britain's first two spool jet engine. 
It was an ambitious development program, something between an upgrade of an existing engine and a completely new design. In retrospect, though, it was probably the right decision. The Olympus 22R built on the RAS operating experience with the Vulcan, where it had proved its reliability. To stretch it to operate at high mark numbers, to accept high intake temperatures over long periods, and to produce 19,600 pound dry thrust and over 30,000 pound in afterburner was nevertheless a major step. In fact, the 22R would never accumulate many operating hours in the air, either on the Vulcan test, test bed or on the only TSR2 to fly. It did provide the base, though, upon which the highly successful Olympus 593 was developed. Development of the 22R was conducted in parallel with that of the airframe and its avionics. Testing got underway at Pystock, the national gas turbine establishment at Farnborough, and progressed to running the engine with very high input intake temperatures for long periods to simulate the conditions that TSR2 would encounter in supersonic crews. These tests were something new to Pystock, and a system of intake heaters was designed and built to create the required conditions in the test chamber. The standard engine type approval test involved 150 hours of running, but the Olympus 22R, because of so many new features, clearly required more. An early Vulcan B1 was converted to become the flying test bed for the Olympus 22R, with the engine mounted under the bomb bay with a representative bifurcated air intake ahead of it. In so doing, it became the only five-engine Vulcan. This photo is of XA894 at the Farnborough Show in September 1962, on just about its only public appearance. The low-pressure shaft on the Olympus 22R was considerably longer than had been fitted to earlier Olympus engines. This change would result in resonance at certain engine power settings, particularly in afterburner. The problem would be identified in engine testing some, part, some time before the first flight of XR219, the first TSR2. On the 3rd of December 1962, the Vulcan test bed was on the ground at Bristol Siddeley's Filton Airfield with a detuner behind it to conduct a full power run of the engine in afterburner. Those on the ground, one hopes at a safe distance, dis described hearing a loud explosion from the engine accompanied by an orange flash. The crew members in the cockpit vacated quickly and the airfield fire service, standing by with their new fire tender, moved in with foam to attack the flames. The aircraft continued to burn and the fuel tanks in the Vulcan's wings soon ruptured, spilling large quantities of aviation fuel onto the concrete. Unfortunately, the gradient, the gradient of the apron ran downwards towards the parked fire engine. <laughs> in the event, nobody was hurt. But the Vulcan test bed, its valuable Olympus 22R, and the fire tender were all destroyed. The loss of the, of the Vulcan was a blow, its cause linked to the failure of the low pressure compressor shaft. The possibility of rapidly converting another Vulcan to the test bed role for the 22R was examined, but would have taken too long to be of use. The next time an Olympus 22R flew, it would be in a TSR2. It's generally agreed that the lack of an early demonstrator program before full launch of the and, and the various programs encountered during testing of the engine considerably slowed TSR2's progress to first flight. It also impacted on the frequency of its test flying after that. Bristol Siddeley made modifications to the engine following the Vulcan accident. These involved strengthening the shaft and improving damping, but a more major redesign was called for which would take time. In the short term, TSR2 pilots would have to accept some restrictions in engine performance and pay particular attention to power settings. TSR2 was designed for penetration missions at low level under the radar. For this role, it had a relatively small near delta wing with a 60 degree leading edge sweep and a small wing area. This resulted in a high wing loading to give good gust response and a comfortable ride for the crew at low level. The wing was built in two halves and joined at the centre line. There was no dihedral, but there were large wing tips with anhedral, these to give the required stability. Blown flaps were fitted to the full length of the trailing edge to improve takeoff and landing runs. The flap blowing was achieved by ducting bleed air from the engine compressor. 
although never seen on a flying TSR. I, I, I do believe this, but maybe somebody can correct me. Pickup points were fitted under wing to mount two store stations under each wing to carry drop tanks or weapons. I never saw them fitted. Maybe they were. Even with blown flaps, a high wing loading is not compatible with short field operation. And one of the requirements for TSR2 was that it should be able to take off from half a runway. That was actually in the spec somewhere. The design aim was meant to ensure that TSR2 could still operate in wartime if the enemy had been unkind enough to put a cratering bomb right in the center of the 8,000 foot standard NATO runway. To assist takeoff performance from such a short run, TSR2's nose wheel leg incorporated an extra 30 inches, 75 centimeters of extension to change the engine's effective thrust line. There is no record of a takeoff ever having been made in this configuration. As you can see from the picture, this feature would also seem to have introduced a few new practical problem. <laughs> You've read my next line. With the full nose wheel extension, you might ask how the aircrew would use the ladder to climb into the cockpit. I say, that, that's at Boscombe Down. It certainly is extended. I don't think it was ever trialed, but that's, that would be part of the way they get out of the short field. This is a strange photo. TSR2 had a large brake chute stowed in a compartment in the rear fuselage between the jet pipes. In order to stream it rapidly on touchdown and thus meet the landing distance requirement, the deployment sequence started by streaming a drogue chute of six foot diameter. This then dragged out the main chute. The main chute was reefed and initially deployed to a diameter of 16 feet, only opening to the full 28 feet when the airspeed had dropped below 135 knots. Early deployment of this two-stage parachute system was carried out on an Avro Shackleton at Farnborough. And I've always thought there's something gloriously incongruous about this photo. Uh, a strange mix of old and new, you know, TSR2 parachute on a, not quite a World War II bomber, but something very clearly developed from it. To achieve TSR2's intended role of low-level strike attack, a new generation of avionic systems needed to be developed. Ferranti was tasked with developing the, the inertial navigation system, the forward-looking radar, and the moving map display. DECA was contracted to produce the Doppler radar. The terrain-following radar depended for its basic input on the forward-looking radar, whose returns continually provided the terrain-following computer with the shape of the terrain ahead in terms of range and angle. The pilot could select a nominal altitude required and the degree of hardness, discomfort of the ride based on the type of terrain being overflown and the degree of discomfort that the crew could reasonably tolerate. These were groundbreaking developments and effective and reliable terrain following equipment was essential for TSR2 to perform its role against the likely enemy who had increasingly effective surface to air missiles. One of the design requirements for the terrain following equipment was that in the case of equipment failure, only up signals were transmitted to the flight control system. A formal contract for the production of a development batch, there were no prototypes, the first aircraft was the first development aircraft, of nine TSR-2s, XR-219 to 227, was awarded in July 1960. For whatever reason, I'll not pursue this one here, Vickers men held most of the major positions on the TSR-2 program. Put simply, the agreement was that Vickers would build, assemble, integrate everything to do with the forward fuselage, the bomb bay, and the undercarriage. English Electric was responsible for all the rest of the airframe. Effective design authority, though, was, although shared, it was probably more with Vickers than it was up north. Committees abounded, ministry equipment, ministry committees. A wonderful comment made to me, I recorded this, from, from, came from somebody who lived through it. He said, there was, no possible, there was no proper integration within the ministry, of course. This business of going to cockpit meetings with 60 people there, and just when you thought you'd got agreement, then somebody from an MOD department would stand up and say he wasn't happy with the colour of the light bulbs. <laughs> it was ridiculous. 
These sort of things plagued such meetings when representatives of departments with expertise in the engine bay rather than the cockpit got themselves involved in cruise station matters. The Olympus 22R, which had been selected for the project by the government, was the subject of a se separate contract with Bristol Sedley. Left to their own devices, it's quite possible that Vickers would have ended, opted for a different engine, maybe the Rolls-Royce Medway. Here, a four-body is joined to the centre fuselage at Weybridge. I have to say that I cannot guarantee that the airframe involved is XR219. It may be. And so, everything seems set for a first flight in mid-1963. Yes, mid-1963. Only now can the story be told. <laughs> it was in late 1963, I think it was that date, it was a long time ago, that an aviation society to which I belonged organised a coach trip to BAC factory at Weybridge to see the VC-10 in production. There were probably 50 or so of us on the coach. As we arrived at the Weybridge main gate, a cheery security guard asked, just for the record, none of you got any cameras, have you? <laughs> well, every one of us had, and some had more than one. Each was then laboriously handed over to security, listed, and a receipt issued. After what seemed like an age, our BAC guide came on board and we drove on to the site. VC-10 production was in full swing. We disembarked to walk into the hangar and along the line, where milling from the solid had been adopted for much of the aircraft structure, a striking example of the best modern practice. When our visit was drawing to a close, we got back on the coach to head for home. But just as we passed one of the hangars, its doors slid open to reveal the TSR-2 line. The first development batch aircraft, 219, was nearest the doors, with a couple more in white paint and other less complete airframes still in primer. Out from nowhere, or should that be out from duffel bags, came many rediscovered cameras, <laughs> which were pointed into the hangar to record the scene. Our BAC, our BAC guide commanded the driver, drive on, while all the other passengers urged him vociferously to stop. <laughs> As a result, the coach lurched forward, halted, with the process repeated several times until the guide's will prevailed and we headed definitively for the main gate. By this time, much film had been exposed on this surprise addition to our tour. As for me, I'd clearly been too honest, possibly too stupid, and handed my camera in earlier. So sadly, this shot is not one of mine. It dates from the 27th of April, 63, and shows XR219 and 220 at the head of the line. This view gives some idea of the densely packed internal arrangement of TSR-2. The weapons bay, 20 foot in length, was intended to carry nuclear or conventional bombs, although the term strike in the TSR-2 designation indicated nuclear. The early red beard nuclear weapon was large, and TSR-2 could have accommodated only one internally or two on underwing pylons. Carrying such weapons externally would have caused an increase in drag and had an effect on range, not to mention the undesirable effect of aerodynamic heating on the nuclear heads. A pair of the later and smaller WE-177 could have been carried side by side in the rear of the bomb bay, while still leaving the forward part for extra fuel tanks. Alternatively, for the reconnaissance role, that's the R in TSR-2, a pallet could be loaded into the bomb bay this mounting a variety of photographic, line scan, and radar reconnaissance equipment. Of note in this view is the amount of space the retracted main undercarriage takes in the centre fuselage area. The cockpit gave the pilot a decent view forward and over the nose, but with little or no vision to the rear. The crew seats were only marginally stepped, and the view from the rear seat was good only to either side or looking upwards. Plans for a two-seat trainer version of TSR-2, the Type 595, envisaged raising the rear seat and putting a single blown hood over both cockpits. Either way, it was never built. By early 1964, the first TSR-2, XR-219, was virtually complete at Weybridge, as seen here. Here it's still in chromate primer, but otherwise looks more or less ready to go. 
The question of where the first flight would take place had been resolved by ministry decision, although perhaps not totally satisfactorily. The runway which had proved adequate for VC-10's first flight but was considered too marginal for TSR-2. The nearby Vickers test airfield at Wisley had a longer runway and transporting XR-219 by road from Weybridge was perfectly viable. English Electric's airfield at Wharton, as already discussed, ticked all the boxes. It had a good runway, an active flight test department and established flight test corridors suitable for TSR-2. So, faced between Weybridge, Wisley and Wharton, which airfield did they choose? None of the above. <laughs> the decision had already been made some time previously that at least the first few development batch TSR-2s would be flight tested at the Ministry airfield at Boscombe Down on the Salisbury Plain. This airfield certainly had all the right facilities, including a 10,500 foot runway, as well as being reasonably close to Weybridge, a distance of road by 65 miles or so. But the need partially to dismantle XR219 to truck it from Weybridge to Boscombe Down would cause an unnecessary delay in achieving first flight of TSR2. This was at a time when the project's costs and progress were coming under intense scrutiny both in the press and in Parliament. Nevertheless, XR219 was taken apart and the sub-assemblies were taken by road to Boscombe Down on the 4th of March 1964. Teams from Vickers, English Electric and Bristol Siddeley Engines were sent to work at Boscombe Down where an area of concrete known as the Pear Drop was, a, was assigned for TSR2 ground testing with suitable holdbacks to allow engine running to full power. I could find no image of XR219 being transported by lorry to Boscombe Down. Maybe none exists. This shot shows the fuselage of XR220, the second aircraft that was running about six months behind 219, arriving on the air apron at Boscombe Down. More of this aircraft later. XR219 by night. It's a nice photo, but was it taken at Weybridge or Boscombe? Does anybody have a good hang on recognition skills here? Anybody like to guess whether... I, I genuinely don't know the answer. Is, is that a, a Weybridge shot? No. No. So it must be Boscombe, realistically. Engine running started at Boscombe Down in spring 1964. The afterburner system developed by Solar in the States proved very reliable and not a single failure to light occurred. Other problems did, though. On one occasion, during a slam acceleration to full afterburner, there was severe combustion instability. The resulting vibration caused the low-pressure drive shaft on the Olympus 22R to be bent. Engineers on the apron reported hearing a noise like a loud pneumatic drill. Another Olympus 22R, which was under ground test at Bristol, suffered a low-pressure shaft failure, the symptoms being embarrassingly similar to those on the Vulcan testbed incident. Engine running continued seven days a week at Boscombe Down and much overtime was accumulated. Taxiing trials with XR219 finally started in early September 1964. There was great pressure to get the aircraft into the air to reassure, if not to silence, its critics. But the engines would have restrictions placed on power settings. Strain gauges were fitted on the low pressure shaft and red lights were rigged in the cockpit to display warnings in case of overstress. Pressures to get XR219 into the air had to be balanced against risk. Engine reliability was still a problem, but the question, when will TSR2 actually fly, was increasingly heard. A general election was to be held on the 15th of October, in which the Conservative government was expected, if opinion polls were to be believed, to be defeated and to be replaced by a new Labour government. And the Labour Party's attitude towards TSR2, which it called a prestige project, was far from clear. Meanwhile, the Royal Air Force requirements people were becoming ever more aware of the American General Dynamics TFX program. This looked likely to produce an aeroplane, the F-111, with similar capabilities to TSR2. Like TSR2, the F-111 had yet to fly, but the attractions of an assured future and a large production run would likely result in a much lower unit cost. 
flight crew for XR 219's first flight will be Roland Beaumont, BAC Chief Test Pilot at Wharton, with Navigator Systems Operator Don Bowen in the back seat. Beaumont and Bowen conferred with engineers and with George Edwards himself. Agreement was reached that the risks of making a first flight when XR219 was fitted with such immature engines were justified, given the absolute imperative of getting the aircraft into the air before the general election. The two installed Olympus 22R engines were signed off by Bristol Siddeley Engines on the 27th of September for just a single flight. This shot shows Roland Beaumont third from left, navigator Don Bowen at extreme right. As an, as an aside, only six people ever flew TSR2, three pilots, three navigators. All three pilots are seen here, with Jimmy Dell at left and next to him, Don Knight. Before XR219 would fly, there was another major event that would affect the program. It too happened at Boscombe Down. XR220, the second development batch TSR2, was lovingly completed at Weybridge and then, as with XR219, partially disassembled for transport by road to Boscombe Down. This shot was actually taken later at Boscombe Down. As an aside, XR220 is instantly recognisable from 219 by the addition of a camera fairing, which is an arrow pointing at it, um, on the side of the intake duct. This was intended to film stores separations when they got to that stage of testing. Anyway, the lorry with XR220's fuselage arrived at Boscombe Down on the 9th of September 1964. Having passed through the no doubt tight security at the gate, it drove onto the apron in front of the hangars. The driver was reversing his trailer when it happened. I have a good friend, sadly now a good late friend, who actually saw it happen. He told me, I was in my office on the first floor when I watched the truck arrive. I turned to speak to my secretary. I turned back and I can remember saying, and here, if any, any of you remember the goon show and blue bottle, at this point he put on his best blue bottle voice to make the point, oh, it's fallen off the lorry. The lorry jackknifed an XR220 steel tarpaulin rolled off onto the concrete. As seen here, it narrowly missed taking out a lightning just to the left. TSR2's left tailpane spigot took the worst of the impact, but the resulting repair effort would delay XR220's first flight for several critical months. The recovery effort involved heavy lifting equipment, inflatable airbags. XR220's fuselage was righted and taken to a hangar where the repair work was to be carried out. It would take time to rejig the fuselage and check all the tolerances. In fact, as we shall see, XR220 was destined never to fly. Another friend, then a Boscombe Down test pilot on C Squadron, the Navy Squadron, remembers XR220's time in its hangar at Boscombe Down while the repair work was going on. He told me, in C Squadron, we had half our hangar commandeered for the assembly of TSR2. A temporary wall had been constructed to divide the hangar into two, each half with its own doors. Security there was naturally high. One morning when we arrived for work, we found a neat hole had been punched through the dividing wall, made of cement sheet material, some six feet above floor level. We learned later that TSR2 assembly had reached the hydraulics on stage over the weekend. A coupling had given up its job and allowed a projectile to fly through the wall. <laughs> In the best Navy tradition, some wit had pushed a stepladder against the wall on our side, ringed the six, six inch diameter hole and added a caption, TSR2 assembly progress viewing. <laughs> Finally, the great day arrived. XR219's takeoff was from Boscombe Downs Runway 24 at 15.28 on the 27th of September 64, a Sunday. It was accompanied by three chase aircraft, a two-seat Lightning flown by Jimmy Dell, a Canberra and a two-seat Meteor. Rotation was at 125 knots and Beaumont held the climb at 200 knots. Two wide circuits of the airfield were made before the aircraft touched down again after a 14-minute flight. The undercarriage was not retracted, but nor was it planned to be. 
Takeoff weight was 76,000 pound. Everything went according to plan, although Beaumont's flight test report did note on touchdown, a lateral judder was felt through the main undercarriage units, which lasted some two to three seconds. He also noted, with present engine ratings, the, engine is, the, the aircraft is clearly critically short of thrust. This situation is likely to dictate the rate of flight development. So the first flight had been achieved three weeks before the date of the general election. That said, it had sadly taken two weeks after the last day of the 1964 Farnborough show. That had been planned as TSR2's public debut. Just a nice shot taken from the meteor overhead Boscombe down. Here's XR219 landing back at Boscombe down, its nose wheel having just touched the concrete while the Canberra chase plane passes overhead. Beaumont and Bowen were both highly positive about the aircraft's performance in the post-flight press conference held later that Sunday afternoon. Beaumont noted that TSR2 could be flown safely by any moderately experienced pilot qualified on Lightning or similar aircraft. He was less happy, I'm told, by someone who was there that day when he got back to the reception area to find that members of the press had eaten all the sandwiches through the summer of 1964, XR219 had been a great attraction for people who live locally to Boscombe Down Airfield. The Jungle Telegraph, which was quite good, gave information about when TSR2 was about to fly or go for a taxi run, and there was a large turnout around the fence for the first flight. As ever, cameras were strictly forbidden, but appeared out of nowhere when the aircraft took off and when it returned to land. As I say, all had gone well, but... The second flight did not take place for another two months. It was not until the last day of December, 31st December 64, that XR219 made its second flight. The intervening weeks were made use of to change both engines, while Bristol Siddeley engines and the National Gas Turbine Establishment invested, investigated the 22-hour shaft failures that were so impacting flight testing. The cause was an excitation of the low-pressure shaft, giving rise to huge stresses and sometimes to failure, the bell mode vibration problem. Until a long-term solution could be designed and implemented, limitations were placed on the engines for the coming flights, and indeed these limitations would continue right to the end of the test program. Here, XR219 is seen on its second flight. A contemporary press photograph which was used in various magazines, one of the captions said that it looked like a startled waterfowl. And I must admit, I think that's a very good analogy. During this flight, a severe vibration in the port engine caused Beaumont extreme difficulties, although Bowen, some feet behind him, felt absolutely nothing. With the undercarriage kept extended throughout the flight, Beaumont burnt off fuel to get to landing weight before landing back at Boscombe Down. More was to come. During the landing roll, extreme undercarriage vibration was encountered, much as on the first flight. So, by the end of 1964, TSR2XR219 had flown twice. Both flights had been reasonably successful, but XR220, which had been due to fly in November, had yet to take to the air, and the whole program really needed some good news. XR219's third and fourth flights took place in early January 65, still with the undercarriage extended throughout. It was on flight five that the first attempt was made to retract the undercarriage. Unfortunately, the port main gear did not r rotate correctly and the leg did not retract fully. Beaumont tried extending the gear again this time, the starboard undercarriage extended, but its bogey did not rotate correctly. At this point, he had both main gears extended, with the front wheel neatly stacked above the rear one on both sides. Beaumont, Bowen, and the engineers on the ground conversed while the aircraft orbited. Ejection might have been the safe route, but Beaumont decided to attempt a landing in the hope that the gentle touchdown would cause the bogey and wheels to rotate to the correct position. Bowen, in the rear seat, elected to stay with him. In the event the gentlest of landings was made, the bogies rotated and all ended well. 
XR219 flew during the winter of 64-65. Seven flights in January, seven in February, eight in March. Here, XR219 is seen on final approach to Boscombe Down with snow on the ground. You may have noticed, if you look carefully, that the main undercarriage bogies are still not correctly aligned, or indeed not even symmetrical. Meanwhile, at Boscombe Down, XR220's rebuild was on its way to completion, although the start of engine running prior to its first flight was delayed by the non-availability of engines. Jimmy Dell was pilot on flight number six. It had always been the intention, in, the intention that Beaumont would make the first half dozen flights before handing over to Dell. Dell would go on to become the highest time pilot on the TSR2 program, making 12 flights and totaling 7 hours 52 in the air. On landing, Dell experienced the undercarriage vibration problem. He recalls, the undercarriage was very flexible and of course you were in this long nose and you were going from one side to the other. Only for about three or four cycles, but initially when it happens, you wonder what the hell is going to happen next and whether the whole thing is going to disintegrate about your ears. Dell also recalls of TSR2's cockpit. When you're strapped in, it's got such a long fuselage, you can't see anything of the aircraft. There was no rear view. We had rear view mirrors, so most of your view was out of the front. You had a super view forward because the nose slopes down very sharply so it was particularly good for the high-speed, low-level flying for which it was primarily designed. Sadly, Jimmy Dell died early in 2008. Blue skies ahead? Well, maybe. Modifications made by BAC led to an easing of the undercarriage's retraction problems, even if they didn't solve them completely. On flight 10, successful retraction and extension were finally achieved in the air. This gave Beaumont, flight pilot for that flight, the chance to take XR219 to higher speeds, and he made several passes overhead Boscombe Down at low level and 450 knots. TSR2 proved a very stable platform. Finally, just maybe, the tide seemed to be turning in TSR2's favour. The TSR2 story inevitably has its political angles. It was a political aeroplane. It's not something I want to dwell on here. But perhaps it's important in the whole TSR2 story to recall where the political parties stood on the programme. The previous Conservative government had been a supporter of TSR2, at least in principle, although it was becoming increasingly horrified at its cost. The new Labour government installed in October 64 was much more suspicious of prestige projects and unhappy to underwrite what it saw as blank checks to support the British aircraft industry and its, quote, all too frequent cost overruns. Nevertheless, the aircraft industry was a great employer across the country, and effort was put into reassuring workers that they had a secure future. This leaflet, distributed widely, promised, Labour will not cancel the TSR2, and there is a great future for the British aircraft industry under a Labour government. I said I won't get political, so I'll leave you to judge how well these promises were kept. <laughs> on 22nd of February 65 and on flight 14, Beaumont and navigator Peter Moneypenny took off from Boscombe Down, destination Wharton. Wharton was the logical place for flight testing of TSR2 to be undertaken, and by this time TSR2 had probably outstayed its welcome at Boscombe Down. During the transit, which lasted 43 minutes, XR219 went supersonic over the Irish Sea in dry power, and then it reached Mark 1.12 in afterburner at 40,000 feet. The arrival overhead Wharton Aerodrome was made at 450 knots and 150 feet. Beaumont's landing was watched by most of the Wharton employees, who turned out to welcome what they undoubtedly thought of as their aeroplane. Here, XR219 is marshalled in at Wharton. Wharton was to be the base for XR219's future flight testing. Here, employees surround, but as you see, are kept at a respectable distance from 219 following its arrival there. There was great excitement that they could finally see in the air and then on the ground the aircraft they had helped to build. 
and I'm told there was a genuine feeling of, uh, feeling of euphoria, at least until the order was issued back to work. In the two months it was at Wharton, XR219 made a further 10 flights, numbers 15 through 24. The envelope was expanded to cover single engine handling and flight at low level. On the 8th of March, XR219 flew twice in one day, which in itself was a first. Jimmy Dell took the aircraft down to 200 feet at 500 knots, reporting the handling as superb because the design of the wing had a cushioning effect. Don Knight, TSR2's third pilot, has his, had his familiarization sortie on flight 12 and flew a performance and handling sortie on flight 23. At Boscombe Down, XR220 was almost ready to fly. This aircraft was initially to be allocated to flutter and stability testing and, of course, to engine development. XR221 and the following aircraft of the development batch were coming off the line at Weybridge. Wharton had all the flight testing equipment and facilities for testing TSR2 and in the spring of 1965, test flying of XR219 became more regular and maybe, just maybe, things were beginning to look up for the project. The undercarriage vibration problem, though, still manifested itself on too many of these flights, including for the first time on takeoff on flight 16. This shot throws, shows three BAC military aircraft, some might say three English electric military aircraft, but that would be stretching the truth a bit, on the apron at Wharton in 1965, Canberra B2, Lightning F6, and TSR2, XR219. The undercarriage, though, was still proving a problem. A simple resolution to the undercarriage vibration problem was attempted by attaching a tie strut between each bogey and its oleo leg. This was intended to stiffen the assembly and to present the main wheels at a different angle to the concrete for landing. This modification was tested in the air on flights 21 through 24. Here, B. Beaumont and Don Bowen are seen on the ramp alongside the main undercarriage of 219. Clouds, though, were gathering. The February 1965 issue of Air Pictorial magazine had a cartoon on its cover for the first time ever. It featured Harold Wilson and his cabinet dressed up as the Seven Dwarves, chopping up TSR-2 and two advanced British aircraft projects, the VSTOL Hawker Siddeley 681 and the supersonic VSTOL P-1154 fighter. The HS-681 and the P-1154 were cancelled in early February 65. The former book would be replaced by an off-the-shelf purchase of Lockheed Hercules, while the latter would see its, its replacement by the purchase of McDonnell Douglas, or McDonnell as it was then, Phantoms. Two out of three advanced British military projects had been axed at a stroke. Only TSR2 held on. Perhaps more ominously, a government paper in February 1965 noted that the TSR2 programme, originally estimated to cost £325 million, is now expected to rise to £750 million, or approximately £5 million per, per aircraft. They don't sound huge figures now, do they? But in those days. For TSR2, the writing was, sadly, on the wall. On 6th of April 1965, which was coincidentally budget day, Jimmy Dell and Peter Moneypenny were at Boscombe Down, ready to make the first flight, the much-delayed first flight, in XR220 later that morning. In the event, after the pre-flight briefing and being given clearance to fly, it was found that a fuel pump needed to be changed. As a result, Dell and Moneypenny retired to a local hostelry <laughs> while the engineers undertook the required work. It was there that they heard, on the radio, the budget speech being broadcast live, and in it, an announcement of the cancellation of the entire TSR2 programme. Chancellor James Callaghan stated TSR2's programme cost as £125 million and the cost is mounting fast every week. He also said that his decision to cancel it would, in the next five years, release £350 million of resources of an advanced kind for more productive work. Instead, an option to purchase 50 F-111 Mark II, F-111K, was taken. 
Dell and Moneypenny raced back to Boscombe Down, intent to fly XR220, but to their dismay found that the paperwork had been rescinded and their aircraft, the, their access to the aeroplane was blocked. XR219 had made just 24 flights. XR220 was destined never to fly. Cancellation on the 6th of April 65 could not have come as a great surprise to anybody on the project or to anyone who appreciated the depth of this country's financial predicament. The government believed that a robust decision to scrap TSR2 would signal to the world its seriousness to do whatever was necessary to tackle the financial problem, and in particular the balance of payments. Nevertheless, the statement that cancelling the TSR2 programme would release and this is the quote, many highly skilled designers, engineers, and skilled workers of various kinds, seems in retrospect a tad naive. TSR2 represented the pinnacle of British military aircraft design. Seeing the program through to completion would have given the RAF an aircraft of unrivaled capability. Yet to some extent, TSR2 had been its own worst enemy there had been an inexorable increase in costs, a slippage in dates. Remember, first flight planned for late 1963, and even perhaps a lessening of support from its only customer, the Royal Air Force. Production at the time of cancellation was proceeding at a pace. This is XR-225, the seventh aircraft of the development batch at Salmsbury. There's no denying, though, that only one aircraft had flown and that it had achieved only 24 flights. While the quoted unit cost of TSR2 maybe does not appear that high by today's standards, the likely production run would have been uneconomically small. For the RAF, 100 aircraft is very much at the upper end of estimates. TSR2's unit costs could have been reduced and the program's stability immeasurably improved had there been an export customer. Australia might well have been that customer. In 1963, an Australian delegation had evaluated, under their air staff requirement 36, a variety of long-range strike and reconnaissance aircraft to replace their Canberras. With a long tradition of buying British aircraft, they found TSR2 met the requirement in almost every respect and an order for 24 aircraft was soon under negotiation. However, after a subsequent visit to the UK to see for themselves progress made, they returned home with the distinct impression that TSR2's support, even in Britain, was only lukewarm. This was underlined during a meeting with Lord Louis Mountbatten, Britain's Chief of the Defence Staff, but very much a Royal Navy man. He reputedly told them that TSR2 was unlikely ever to enter RAF service and that Buccaneers would be, published, would be purchased instead. You might ask with friends like Mountbatten, who needs enemies? Australian worries were further compounded by the fact that the RAF itself had not yet, yet ordered a production batch of TSR2s. On the 24th of October 63, the Royal Australian Air Force announced an order for 24 F-111s. Although not recognised that such at the time, this was clearly an early nail in TSR2's coffin. This shot shows F-111Cs at Amberley, Queensland in 1975. The type served the Australian Air Force until 2010. The RAF had great plans for TSR2. Although named for tactical, and that's the big word, tactical strike and reconnaissance, TSR2's radius of action and its ability to refuel in flight gave it a near strategic capability. The Vulcan B2, perhaps the finest of the RAF's V bombers, had come to the end of its production run. With advances in Soviet missile technology, its survivability, if it had to deliver a nuclear weapon into the Soviet Union, was at least debatable. The Blue Steel standoff missile with a range of 100 miles had increased the Vulcan's ability to penetrate Soviet defences, and the Vulcan had been re-rolled re to low level to avoid radar detection, but it was very much a short-term solution. TSR-2 supersonic at altitude and with excellent high-speed terrain-following capability would have provided a formidable aircraft for the strike roll. 
Without TSR-2 or a similar aircraft, the RAF would lose any semblance of a strategic nuclear strike capability, or indeed any realistic east of Suez capability. In recent years, while researching TSR-2, I've spoken to various people in the RAF's requirement planning, and I have the distinction that the RAF was actually expecting TSR-2's cancellation, and that perhaps it wasn't that worried about it. The RAF had been keeping very close to developments with the American F-111 program, and on the quiet, the government had negotiated an option to buy 50 F-111s for the RAF. The bargain basement price negotiated is reputed to have been £2.1 million a copy. General Dynamics promised that the F-111 would go further and faster than TSR-2, but the real attraction to the RAF was that it had confidence that the American program would actually be seen through to fruition. Once program cancellation had been announced, there was an almost indecent haste to destroy evidence of its existence. The ministry had the right, of course, to do this. It had paid the bills, it had owned the flying aircraft, one rather than two, the jigs, the documentation, the mock-ups, and a number of part-completed airframes. Some people interpret the decision as spite on behalf of the government to spare it embarrassment in the future. In fact, much the same had befallen everything to do with the Vickers V1000 programme on its cancellation some years earlier. In that case, the edict had come from Vickers Sir George Edwards in order not to leave dead corpses lying around. This sad sight of TSR2 fuselages being cut up was taken at Salmsbury in September 65. Many employees, it is said, raided the piles of scrap and took home a piece of TSR2 as a keepsake. Sad, really. This is the mock-up being burnt at Wharton on the 30th of June 65. A sad sight and surely a tragic one for those who'd spent up to five years working on the project. But the destruction was not total. Two near-complete TSR-2s did survive to this day in museums, but not XR-219. BAC was conscious that in TSR-2, XR-219, which was flying, and XR-220, which was ready to fly, they had valuable research tools. These had direct relevance to both future military programs and to Concorde. They therefore proposed to the government a limited programme of research flying with TSR-2. The government, though, was having none of it. It made known that any attempt to pursue the idea might, in, might impact negotiations on comp compensation payments negotiated in respect of the programme's cancellation. XR-219 was the most emotive airframe. The Ministry found a neat solution to get it away from public view by trucking it along with XR-221 and 223, to the proof and experimental establishment at Shoebury Ness. Here, well out of public view on the Essex coastline, it was used as a range target. There was hope in some circles that this aircraft was far too important simply to be shot at, and that the government employees on the range would, on the quiet, keep it safe. Sadly, this was not the case, and all three airframes were reduced to tangled pieces of metal over a period of time. This is 219 at Shoebury Ness, a historic aircraft, if ever there was one. You see the undercarriage sticking up into the, into the air. As previously noted, one wonders how worried the RAF was. After all, it would get the F-111K, which had at least similar capabilities to TSR-2. In the event, the F-111 order was cancelled in 1968, although not before the first two aircraft for the RAF were making their way along the General Dynamics production line at Fort Worth. RAF Coningsby had been earmarked as the RAF's first TSR-2 base. Following TSR-2's cancellation, it was then designated as the RAF's first F-111 base. In fact, it would never see either aircraft. In an increasingly farcical story, the F-111K was to be replaced by an Anglo-French variable geometry aircraft, the AFVG, a twin-engine swing-wing design that owed much to Dassault's Mirage family, but ended up looking not totally unlike the Panavia Tornado. 
This project, though, fell apart in summer 1967 in disagreement over work share and project leadership. If nothing else, this unhappy episode underlined the joys and the challenges of working with the French. <laughs> Interestingly, no purely British military aircraft project has been embarked upon since TSR-2. Jaguar, Tornado and Typhoon have all been multinational. And as we all know, multinational programs spread the development cost over a larger production run, as well as being more difficult to cancel. But one wonders, do they actually improve the time taken for the aircraft to reach frontline service? Only in 1982, when the first Panavia tornado arrived on the front line, would the RAF have an aircraft with anything like the same capability as TSR-2. And even then, Tornado did not have a comparable unrefueled range. This photo is of a tactical weapons conversion unit Tornado taken in 1986. Opinions differ as to how successful TSR2 might have proved in RAF service, and indeed when it might have entered RAF service. On the latter point, I don't believe it would have made it to the front line until maybe 1974, maybe 1975. Despite the problems with the undercarriage and the engine, TSR2 acquitted itself well in the 24 flights it made. There seems little doubt that these problems could have been resolved, albeit at a cost. XR219 was very much an aerodynamic test airframe with few of TSR2's advanced avionics installed, or indeed even available at the start of the flight test program. Thus to call TSR2 a world beater is possibly an overconfident statement bearing in mind how relatively immature the aircraft was at the time of its cancellation. But then a world beater it might certainly have become. I talked to Jimmy Dell at Duxford in 2005. I asked him when he thought TSR2 would have entered RAF service. He said, probably mid-70s, it would have had to undergo so many tests to satisfy so many people. I was anxious to try and get the Americans to have a trip in it because they came across to look at it, but politics stepped in and they weren't allowed to fly it. I think they would have been very impressed with the performance at that stage. Jimmy Dell was extremely positive on the programme. Oh, it was without doubt a world beater. There wasn't another aircraft that would meet the flying specifications and do it so well. And that was at the very early stages in the programme, which is quite remarkable. On the other hand, I've discussed TSR2 with a number of people from Boscombe Down people who call themselves boffins, although that's not a term you hear now, about their take on the programme. The general opinion and the most frequently expressed view seems to be that the airframe and the engines were doing well and that any problems could have been resolved, but that the avionics might well have been lagging years behind and might have delayed TSR2's entry into service. This photo, this wonderful photograph, is uh, Jimmy Dell in the front and Don Knight behind him, two of the three... TSR2 pilots, unveiling the restored XR222 at the War Museum at Duxford in December 2005. He pulls the string and the, uh, the cockpit cover comes off. So what is left of TSR2? Well, certainly not XR219. As far as I know, there's absolutely nothing of that. This photo is of Don Knight left and Jimmy Dell right in front of the restored XR222 at the War Museum at Duxford in December 2005. This aircraft, the fourth in the development batch, was not complete at the time of the program cancellation, but somehow it escaped the scrap man and avoided the ignominy of having things fired at it at Shoebrinness. It spent some years at Cranfield before moving to the Imperial War Museum at Duxford, where it was restored to exhibition standard although it lacks much of its internal equipment. Following its restoration, it was towed out from what they now call the Conservation in Action hangar onto the concrete apron on 16th of December 2005, pausing for just a couple of hours to allow the official unveiling and some photography. It was then towed into the airspace hangar where it remains on show to this day. The other one is XR220 at Cosford. The second development batch TSR2, XR220, the one that so nearly flew but didn't, is preserved at the RAF Museum at Cosford. 
It lives in the flight test hangar and is displayed alongside an Olympus 22R engine. On rare occasions, but sometimes for the station's annual air show in June, it is towed outside and gives a rare chance to photograph the whole aircraft. This shot was taken on the 11th of June 2015, the Friday before that year's Cosford show. Which brings me to the end of my presentation. <laughs> a presentation, I have to say, on an aircraft that has fascinated me for more than 50 years. Had TSR2 entered service in, with the RAF in the 1970s, it's not too fanciful to imagine that later marks of the aircraft might still be in service today. Certainly there would have been far less need for the tornado, while Britain's aircraft might have maintained that capability and the all-important self-belief to continue to go it alone on military aviation projects. I've tried to give you a broad brush view of the programme and to underline the fact that TSR2 remains an emotive subject where many people hold differing views. Something I've learned is if you talk to 10 people who've been involved with the programme, you'll probably get 10 completely different takes on where it was, what it was going to do, what it would have cost. Somewhere in the middle is the truth, but I'm not sure there is one truth. In conclusion, I'd be hard put to sum up the whole programme better than did Don Knight when I talked to him some years ago. He described TSR2 as the great might have been. And I think with that comment, he hit the nail firmly on the head. Thank you. Dennis, I think we're all in awe of your forensic analysis of the story, the sad story. Yes. You've held us for 75 minutes. Almost exactly. Well done, you. <laughs> um, completely absorbing. And, you know, it's hard to think that you could have packed any more in. But we have a Q&A session now. Right. And so amongst us, I'm sure, are people who've done work on, worked on TSR2, or have historical information and questions they'd like to put to Dennis, and this will be your opportunity. So are there any questions? Thanks very much for your very interesting summary of the whole thing. The concentration, obviously, was a lot on airframe and the engine side. There were a couple of mentions of avionics. Yes. But there was a real big challenge in the avionics and the electronics industry to actually develop the... Uh, ground following, terrain following radar and the display moving map stuff because me as a very rookie graduate in 1960 was working at Elliott Automation in Boreham Wood, I don't know anybody else was involved there, but they had a major part of the digital computing aspect of the, uh, the avionics system for TSR2 and obviously took a bit of a hit as well when, uh, when it was all cancelled but uh, be interested if you can add anything about that aspect of the, the programme. Only second hand. Um, my, 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 if I could turn the question around, do you, do you feel that avionic development was sort of keeping up with airframe development and engine development? I wasn't personally closely involved with it at the time, but uh, they, were, they were struggling to move from, I think, what was... All aircraft control systems were largely analogue driven in those days, and the whole thing required it to move to a digital kind of solution. And that was the big challenge, finding a small enough, fast enough digital computing system that would actually drive this thing, yeah? Thank you. Can we hang on just a moment, sir? So I can just bring... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The cooling was terrific because there were two radium transistors and not silicon. It really was quite something. Another comment you made at the end was we also knew tornado if TSR2 without the range. In fact, the whole of the avionics for uh, tornado was based on the TSR2 system and a lot of the people in industry and the government who worked on TSR2 then used their experience on Tornado. 
I, I think that's a very fair point, and I, I think also that the engine development work done on the 22R was probably very valuable, and indeed sharing the cost on the 593 for the Concorde. I think there are various things that were learnt from TSR2 and were inherited from TSR2, but whether it represented good value for money, it's very difficult to say at this stage. Right, Dennis, thank you very much for filling in a lot of gaps for me because as an 18-year-old apprentice working on a TSR2 the day they scrapped it, it's got some pretty horrible memories. I even took part as an apprentice, which was illegal at the time, on the Save the TSR2 march, which went through, I believe, from outside the Houses of Parliament to Speaker's Corner a week or two before. But the way you described it, the way it was destroyed, was absolutely unbelievable. As an apprentice, I turned in to work, was told by the apprentice supervisors, put your toolboxes over there and go to the apprentice training school. All subcontractors, which I guess was the English electric guys, you're getting paid down here till four o'clock and you're not getting paid any more after that. <laughs> the Britney Vickers guys were told, just hang around here, We'll find you somewhere to go. It might not be today. It might not be next week. And that's how they did it. It was as simple as that. Were you expecting cancellation, honestly? Uh, yeah. I, bl I believe we fought the battle. All the trade unions fought the battle. But I think it was a bit of a, a loser. I mean, I was actually working on undercarriages <laughs> in there. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I've never seen so many people. I believe it was Dunlop produced the wheels and... I've never seen so many bearings changed and things like that. But as I say, I was just a dog's body, the boy who pumped the wheels and the undercarriage went up and everything like that at the time. But it's pretty horrible memories. Did, did you stay with the company after TSR2? I stayed till I finished my time. And then obviously with the VC10 suffering the same fate as the TSR2 was suffering, um, I went to British Airways and or BEA and then did 30 years there. Okay. Okay, thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. I don't really want to ask a question. I'd just like to add to what the previous speaker said. I was working uh, as an ex-apprentice in, uh, in the TSR2 office on the afternoon of the cancellation. Um, I can remember now the rattle as the subbies put down their pencils. I picked up my slide drawer and ran back to the civil office. Um, the next morning, yeah, the scrappy was out there cutting things up. It was a very, very sad time. Um, and uh, uh, one that I think a lot of us will never f forget who were involved in it. Um, for various reasons, I took lunch uh, with the ladies who were, the group of ladies who were secretaries and PAs to the, um, uh, the directors, and I had it on their assurance that the directors were not sure when it, when it, it was actually going to happen. Um, and we were somewhat taken aback when it preceded the, uh, uh, the budget as it did. For, this is a follow-on from the very first question, rather on the avionics. Uh, and you mentioned the forward-looking radar. What about the sideways-looking radar? Yes. Okay. Because uh, my connection with this is I was with originally the War Office, came to the Ministry of Defence, and uh, then I got involved with developing a moving map, um, in quotes, map display in the navigator's cockpit as to how he would know where he was going. There's a forward looking radar, you can't navigate by that. You had to look out the side. And all he had was radar images on the side. I mean, there was some amazingly advanced equipment going into TSR2. The question is really, was it sort of over-specified for what the RAF could actually afford? Not for what it wanted, but for what it could no, afford. Yeah, but to fly at the speed that it would, down about Mark 1, at heights between 50 foot and, say, 500 feet, you do need some help in navigating. <laughs> <laughs> and it was pretty much an all-British effort, wasn't it, on the, on the avionics side? <clears throat> what it was, what I was involved with, was um, developing um, an in-the-cockpit, navigator's cockpit, display of what he should be seeing on his radar screen. And what was that involved? That involved, from my point of view, it was official secrets acts and all sorts of things, but... Um, painting, literally painting, in 
black book, white through black, and millions of shades of grey, is what you get on a radar picture of what the, the radar return would look like. Okay? Uh, and, uh, but he would know what was coming. Because this would move through. And the way we did it was, um, I had to do it, was uh, interpreting um, very, very high level aerial photography. In fact, taken from satellites. These are American photographs. <clears throat> the quality of the film, which was the real secret, was the, the quality of the, the actual film. I've seen pictures where they demonstrate it. You can read a number plate in, Mox in Moscow. Now that's impressive. Right. <clears throat> Thank you. This question is purely a, a, a point of view. Um, had the TSR2 been an American design, would they have binned it? <sighs> There's an impossible one, yes. <sighs> you think so? I don't know. I don't know. Even though, well, okay, it, it was an amazing piece of machinery, and the Americans do actually quite well building amazing machinery. But the TSR2 was binned for, for, for politics, isn't it? I think. But had it been American design, that thing would have flown, I think. That's my opinion. I, I, I think you'd, yes, I mean, you'd have to throw money at the programme to yeah. sort of get it back on track uh, in the way that the Americans do or do if they want to. And I'm not sure it would have been done in this country, but okay, fine. there was nothing inherently unsolvable in the design as far as I can see. <laughs> Apart from money, yes, that's right. Uh, and a ridiculously small production run, which probably wouldn't have gone into three figures. Um, I just want to follow up on the gentleman who just asked the question about whether the Americans would have binned it or not. My uncle worked on the um, Blue Streak rocket program up in uh, Cumbria. And at the time, the Americans were spending ten times the amount the British were spending, um, yet we got Blue Streak to fly. Uh, but again, that was cancelled in uh, lieu of Concord. My follow-up question really is, is it's about the operational use of it. That um, Would it have replaced the Vulcan is the first question. And had it done so, would it have been able to achieve the Black Buck raids on Port Stanley? I don't think the RAF could ever say that the TSR-2 was intended to, to replace the Vulcan, but I think there was a strong feeling that it was their last chance of having a strategic bomber. Um, there were various plans for putting missiles under it and goodness knows what. But uh, no, it, it wasn't a long-range aircraft in the, in the Vulcan's sense, I suppose, so I doubt it would have been seen in the South Atlantic. But I do believe that had it flown, had it gone into service, that is a Mark II or a Mark III version, which would have been uh, much more digital than the, you know, the original TSR II was, would probably still be in service, certainly into this century, whether, whether now perhaps that's stretching it, but you know, 1975 into the 2000s is quite possible. And I think a lot of people are very sad that it didn't, but it didn't. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, when you look at that photograph, what a remarkable aircraft. You have to say, revolutionary before it's time. Now, um, I know that Mike Salisbury wants to say a few words. The very first beginning of well, my first involvement was, in fact, the work until the launch of TSR-2 was started was done at Supermarines and not here. And when the decision was taken, uh, the Supermarine team were brought up here to carry on the work here. That was a very interesting talk. It takes me back into seven years of my life. And I remember as I, after it was cancelled and I drove home across the track, see these broken up bits of TSR2 to remind me of those years. It was, I think, an excellent review of, of everything. It was interesting to hear Jimmy Dell's uh, views on it at the end. I'd just like to thank you, uh, Dennis, for um, an excellent review. I, it brings so much of it back to me. I actually did a very similar talk in this room 31 years ago to the Royal Aeronautical Society, and many of the slides are the same slides. Indeed. Well, they, were, <laughs> they were slides in those days. Proper slides. <laughs> Can we have a round of applause for the speaker? Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Mike. I'm now going to hand back to Rob for the uh, traditional...